Having to fight back against countless interstellar invasions from simple alien armies to outright eldritch abominations or living planets has hardened humanity into self-sufficient isolationists. Though they won't try to invade the outer galaxy in retaliation, humans are infamous across the stars for their ruthless annihilation of any who trespass into their territories. Where once we looked at the stars with wonder, dreaming of the day we would meet our life, now is burning hatred and the bitterness of broken dreams. The enemy was going to catch them. They had no weapons to defend themselves, nor that they know how to operate them. Everyone he had ever known was dead. All the adults were dead. She was alone. And she had nine young children that now were her responsibility to get to safety. It said there was no safety, anywhere. And she was only 17. She didn't know what to do. End's thoughts kept going around and arriving at the same desperate place. The last adult alive, Wiro, had engaged their blink drive to fling them to the edge of known space in a desperate attempt to buy some time. He had expired before the teleportation was concluded. He had said he left behind a dark matter explosion that should give us a few hours before they would find our trail. It was just that she had no idea what to do now. She was still cradling Wiros's dead body, having his blood spattered on her from Wiros' last difficult gurgle breaths. The children were waiting in the cafeteria area, probably scared and crying. She hadn't moved for a quarter increment, because she didn't know what to do. She felt she couldn't make a mistake if she did nothing. She knew inaction was a definite mistake, but just couldn't get up. She hadn't even met Wiro two days ago, a lifetime ago. Her happy life with her happy family on her beautiful and peaceful planet was a distant memory. Did it really happen even? Or was she in reality always been sitting here? A dead body on her lap and mind filled with agony, loss and torment. She wasn't sure. She was pulled out of her shock by another shock, an incoming message. The ship's automation hadn't informed her about a proximity alarm being tripped, yet on the big screen was an image of a humanoid being clad in deep blue metallic clothing from head to toe. A blue visor hid the face completely. The voice was angry. You have violated sovereign Terran Union space. You have 20 seconds to leave or be destroyed. Ennis tried to find a button to talk to the alien. If I were a respond button, where would I be? No. No, 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 no! I don't know how to answer. I don't know and the children will die. This can't be happening, it just can't. She yelled aloud. Why did none of the buttons have any actual words written? Just abbreviations that meant nothing to her. Two days ago, she had been thinking about how to get her crush to notice her and how to pass the math test next week. An errand, absurd thought reminded her she didn't have to worry about that math test anymore. A single hysterical giggle got out before she managed to stop it. Will being destroyed hurt much, Mr. Alien? Should I tell the kids so they can say their goodbyes, or is it kinder to not tell them they're going to die? Tell me that, emotionless alien! She ran into the big screen. You can go home proud today, after killing ten innocent scared children. I am protecting my people from you genocidal Xenos. I'll let you know, miss. Came a reply from the blue-clad alien. Well, we are fleeing from said genocidal Xenos. All that's left of our people. In two days they genocided us. I spent two days witnessing the horrible murder of my loved ones. Everyone I know and my entire people. This is space vehicle is the only one we got out, and they have pursued us relentlessly. So go ahead, if it pleases you to destroy us before they catch us soon. Maybe you can save us from a prolonged death. What's... that's... stand by. Sir, it's just ten civilians, and the weapons aren't powered. They're ice cold. Yes, sir, I know the Rooklings pretended to be civilians, and when escorted to receive aid, they released hundreds of thousands of tiny drones, each carrying dark matter bombs that detonated all at once in Thedic's freeze atmosphere turned the air into magma and killing 13 million settlers. But sir, these are children, and being pursued by genocidal enemies. Uh, but sir, yes, I remember the weary and sent children, we transferred them to our carrier and headed towards New Siena. Still on board when orbiting the Warians, remote detonated the payload sewn into the children's clothing. The venting, burning carrier crashed on New Siena. The death toll greatly grew when the Warians used the resulting lapse in border control and made successful bombing rounds on the rest of the solar system to the tune of 25 billion dead. Yes, sir. Orders received. Girl, I am sorry. Move away or be destroyed. Enns bowed her head and waited for the end, wondering how much it would hurt. You have violated Sovereign Terran Union space. You have 20 seconds to leave or be destroyed. Enns was vaguely curious why the aliens said that yet again. Power down your weapons and turn back immediately. Enns was starting to feel a little faint. Her brain worked somewhat sluggishly. Well, she didn't think she had weapons powered. Then she heard them. 
the enemy. Fear cleared her head. You and what army, puny bean? Your ship is so tiny we don't even have it in our sensors. You have five seconds. We claim that vessel by right of conquest. It is rightfully ours. We have annexed their planets and finished purging them. But these beans here. And that ramshackle ship is the last bastion of the feeble race. We want them purged. Do not try standing in our way. We shall clash later when we have come this far. None shall live but us, the chosen people. Not this again. Eden suddenly saw a bright blue-green spherical explosion. Which one had been blown up? She hoped it wasn't the blue alien. He had at least tried to save her and the other children. The big screen flickered on, showing a gigantic spaceship coming to view, with something like black smoke evaporating from around it. It had been so close the entire time. Ens thought it was as large as her home planet. Sir, our existence has been threatened by yet another chosen people purging the galaxy. I've just sent you the data time by copy before ending the spaceship. Yes, without revealing my ship. Yes, sir, it is unfortunate. Yes, the same rhetoric again. Thank you, sir. They did say they claimed the other ship by right of conquest and demanded to get to destroy it to finish purging their people. No, sir. The chosen people arrived just before I was to destroy the smaller vessel. If I may, sir, I have an idea. Ends have been instructed to get the other children and wait. A little later, their ship jolted a bit, and a weird sound reverberated through the ship walls, followed by a hiss. Then lice appeared on the floor, and the voice of the blue alien told them to follow them. The children, who just two days earlier would have happily skipped on the pretty lights, were now scared and hesitant to move. Ends led by example, and coaxed the others to follow. She was holding the baby. They followed the lights right to a dark, round hole on the outer wall. The blue alien instructed them all to remove everything they were wearing. Had Ez not heard about the remote activated bombs on the clothes of other hapless children, she would have been a lot more alarmed. The four boys in the group refused to remove their clothes in front of the girls, even when threatened to be left behind. Why are you boys not obeying Ends? Show some respect. She just saved all your lives and convinced me to help you. That was the first time in 800 years that the Wee Terrans had let anyone into our territory. Do what she says. A red light show on every available surface underlined the alien's ire. The boys disrobed hastily. Then they were instructed to, one at a time, go into the hole in the wall, now illuminated bright yellow. They were to be scanned, sanitised and given new clothing. Enns entered first to show the younger ones it was okay. In the yellow light, Enns could see two walls on her sides. There was nothing but darkness in front of her. Red light swirled around her, but she felt nothing. A green light illuminated a new space that was only darkness before. She stepped in. Some sort of radiation hung for a short time, and then a white cloud descended from top. Minty. The blue alien told Enns to wait there, while another child placed the baby to be scanned. Enns then picked up the baby, and went through sanitation together with her. Soon all the children had been scanned and sanitized, were smelling minty, and clad in soft, white garments individually fabricated to their sizes. Then they entered the shuttle. The blue alien didn't show up, but there was food for them to eat and large windows to look out from. The shuttle was remotely operated, and took them to a space station that was to be scrapped. It wasn't broken or anything, explained the blue alien, just out of date with its amenities. When the shuttle parked in a shuttle bay in the station, the side door opened. The blue alien was standing on the dock. His helmet evaporated like the black smoke earlier. A dark-haired, beige-skinned alien, Terran, looked at them with two happy blue eyes. Welcome to the Terran Union. You are safe here.